In this episode of Brain Ponderings, I talk with the German neuroscientist Wolf Singer about the hard problem of consciousness and how it might be solved. Perhaps more than anyone else in the world, Wolf has elucidated how neural networks in the cerebral cortex process information. His research has spanned more than 50 years and has provided evidence that unlike modern day computers, with they're capable of machine learning and and the deep learning of artificial intelligence systems, unlike those systems, the human brain functions as an analog computer, wherein computations are performed in high dynamical state space provided by nonlinear dynamics that evolve in the recurrent network of delayed couple oscillatory circuits. Now that's a mouthful and uh, Wolf will unpack that in our conversation. Wolf is a professor at the Max Planck Institute of Brain Research and the Institute for Advanced Sciences, Sciences in Frankfurt, Germany. He's a member of the German Academy of Sciences and a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, uh, as am I. And um, so uh, welcome, Wolf. So you were born, Wolf, you were born during World, World War II, is that right? Yes, in Munich in 1943, wow. during one of the first really severe bomb attacks. So I spent the first hours of my life in a shelter. Wow. And you were fortunate to survive. And you have siblings? Yeah. You have siblings? Yes, I have. I have a sister that is who is three years younger. She lives in America in Charlottesville. And I have a brother who is 11 years younger and he lives in my hometown uh, in the village where I was uh, raised more or less. So you, you grew up in, uh, and then you went to Munich. So you spent a lot of time in Munich, right? You were University of Munich. Yeah, I, yeah. I went. I, I was raised on the, in countryside, and at the time there were no no higher educational schools, so I had to go to boarding school. But this was in Upper Bavaria, very nice place, actually the place where the um, um, Strauss uh, composed uh, one of his operas, uh, the Rosenkavalier. And uh, okay, it was a, a very cultivated place. And yeah. then I went to Munich for studying medicine uh, with a um, one year going to Paris, doing something related to medicine and neurophysiology, returned to Munich, and then entered the Max Planck Institute for Psychiatry for my uh, thesis. And you, um, you were with Otto Kreutzfeld. You were with Otto Kreutzfeld in Munich. Yeah. And he, he that's was the, my mentor. That's the yeah. Kreutzfeld from Kreutzfeld Jakob disease, right? It's a son. The son. Um, it's the okay. son of Jakob. Okay, that I guess that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I had a podcast yeah. on I had a podcast on prion disorders, so I was wondering what you know. Okay, so um, it's his son, and that's that's where you learn to do electrophysiology and the cat visual uh, visual cortex. Well, during my my year in Paris. Uh, through the mediation of Otto Kreuzfeld, who already was uh, protecting me a little bit, because he knew that I was going to start a thesis with him, I uh, joined a um, graduate school in Paris on neurophysiology that was directed by Pierre Buzer. It was very fortunate because as a young student, I got in contact with, um, with hardcore neurophysiology. We built our amplifiers, we did intracellular recordings from spinal cord, so this is where I learned my my first steps in neurobiology. Yeah, and um, and of course the visual system. So Hubel and Weasel, who got the Nobel Prize, right, for essentially identifying the ocular dominance columns in the visual cortex, um, and the developmental the, the what's that? discovery of critical the discovery of critical oh periods, critical period yeah yeah. Yeah. achievements yeah and 
So can you talk a little bit about the visual cortex itself? Um, I, I guess kind of just go to, uh, I don't know what he'd say, neurophysiology, neurophysiology 101 almost, you know, how's the information from the eyes get to the visual cortex? And then in general, what happens? <laughs> yeah, well, um, the reason why I, I was working mostly in the visual system was because my mentor was interested in the visual system of the Kreuzfeld. So he put me on this um, on this topic. Um, and at the time when I started, and this is, is a, it's many years ago, huh? it's something like uh, 55 or 16 years ago, um, we had a very clear concept of how the sensory systems would work. Uh, very much um, determined by the behavioristic stance, uh, we were thinking that the sensory surfaces transform sensory sig um, physical signals, chemical signals into neuronal signals. And then you have a serial processing step by step um, through the thalamus up to the visual primary visual cortex and then on to higher order visual areas. And that there be a sequence of filter operations that extract features, recombine features until finally at the end of the processing hierarchy, you would have the so-called grandmother cell uh, representing um, concrete perceptual objects. Um, and from there, we thought that, uh, it would go out to the, somehow to the motor system and you would get responses there. And we thought that if we diligently work our way from the sensory surfaces all the way into the system until we get out on the motor side, we would have understood the brain. And this was, was one of these great hopes, but also great disappointments, because um, it actually didn't happen. Uh, we didn't discover um, how the brain works. We discovered a lot of mechanisms, but uh, many mysteries remained. Leave alone where the percepts are formed, where the conscious experience takes place, and so forth. Um, but this is how we started, and I think this approach was very successful. It culminated to some extent in the work of Hubert Wiesel, who showed these feature detecting neurons. This was the basis of <clears throat> this hierarchical view to go from simple cells to complex cells to hypercomplex cells and then on to object recognizing or object coding cells in the inferior temporal cortex. <clears throat> so all this seemed very, very nice and plausible. Uh, but then it turned out that, um, of course, always complications come after big discoveries. Mm -hmm. uh, we discovered that the receptive fields that had been described so wonderfully by Hubel and Wiesel um, were much, much more complicated when you challenge the responses of neurons with complex patterns. Then sometimes you don't even find again the basic structure of these receptive fields. Nevertheless, this concept was extremely fruitful because it nurtured the design of what is now the big hype of the deep learning networks, because they are based on these architectures, uh, feed-forward architectures that use uh, neural networks that extract features, recombine features, and uh, <clears throat> through tuning the connections that relate the activity of one layer to the next layer by divergence and conversions, um, you end up with these uh, deep learning networks that learn through a non-physiological mechanism, the PREC propagation mechanism, but they do wonderful things as we now know. Uh, so this has tempted some of us to actually believe that, yeah, we have solved the problem. Uh, we are able to build machines that mimic cognitive abilities of our brains. So um, if we can build a system that does what the brain does, fine, we have understood it. Uh, it turns out again to be much more complicated. <laughs> and, and, and that this concept is certainly um, well, it, 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 part. it's complicated from the very beginning. It, you know, each individual neuron, you know, they have often elaborate dendritic arbors and long branching axons, and no, no two neurons are structurally identical. In, in other words, right. there, there, there are similarities between different types of neurons, you know, pyramidal neurons, large, la long axon that extend a long way, 
in inhibitory interneurons, smaller, shorter uh, processes. But if you look at each individual neuron, they're all different. None of them are identical. So, um, yeah. And, and, and yet we're we're encoding it. as humans. We think, you know, you and I kind of think we're encoding pretty much the exact same thing, right? So then, and then you get to networks, right? So you there's not whatever ninety billion or so neurons in the brain. Most of them are excitatory glutamatergic neurons. That's kind of the main circuitry. Then you've got these other neurotransmitters that are modulating that ongoing activity. And it, all of a sudden, it becomes uh, unwieldy, right? So one of your, your main things you, I think, if you know, I follow your work, I, I've followed your work correctly, is that you've come to the conclusion that that our perceptions are not necessarily coded by some spatial aspects of the neural structure, but uh, by temporal, kind of a temporal coding. So can you kind of uh, discuss what I've said in yeah, terms of your find? I mean, there's yeah. a lot. I mean, this is contrasting very nicely the the deep learning networks that are so beautifully performing in, in object and pattern recognition. Uh, these machines uh, do not code in the temporal domain because all the computational steps, they are timed by the computer clock yeah, and they have to work um, stepwise in a serial way, and uh, temporary relations actually do not do not matter in these systems. Um, while in the brain, and I can elaborate on this a long time. Yeah, I know um, the single neuron is an analog computer, a very complex analog computer with a lot of different inputs and one output. It has a threshold. Yeah, it produces spikes. But these spikes are frequency modulated, so they they mirror the membrane potential of the neuron, and this neuron then communicates this frequency coded signal to the next neuron, where it is retransformed into an analog signal. So most of the computations occur in the analog domain, which is already a big difference with respect to the artificial systems. And yes, uh, if you look at the brain, and uh, next year, I think it will be the 100th anniversary of, of Berger, who discovered uh, the alpha rhythm in the brain. Huh. A lot of the activity that you can report from the brain is extremely complex, it's dynamic. The brain is an ever changing organ, and there are wave patterns in all sorts of frequencies, starting from below one hertz all the way up to 200 hertz. And these frequencies are nested in each other, have complex relationships among each other. They are state dependent. Um, actually, we use them in order to identify sleep stages and so forth and yeah. arousal. Yeah. Um, so in our hands, the brain is an extremely dynamic system. And there is a long standing controversy on the question to which extent these dynamics are computationally relevant or are irrelevant or epiphenomena. Because if you have a, a circuit that extracts um, contours and contrast, um, the best thing is you you implement lateral inhibition. Mm. And um, mm. as soon as you have inhibition realized by a recurrent feedback with inhibitor interneurons, you get an oscilla oscillating circuit. Um, these circuits have the tendency to oscillate. So the question is, you see these oscillations, are they epiphenomenal? Are they just serving contrast enhancement, gain control, um, feature extraction, filter operations, or do they play a computational role? Now, I think we have a game changer now since we started to address this question, uh, not experimentally, because it's extremely difficult. And this may have some bearing on our later discussion on consciousness. So I, I better tell it now okay. and later because it's this context as well. Um, since it is so difficult to distinguish in an intact, integrated, complex system, uh, <clears throat> what is a phenomenon or an epiphenomenon, yeah. whether something that you observe is relevant for function or is just, as I just explained, a phenomenal. Very difficult in complex systems, if you want to 
obtain causal evidence, you would have to interfere with one of these variables that you want to explain. Yeah. But this inevitably interferes with all the other processes. If you want to knock out the oscillations, you have to knock out a certain transmitter system, but they will change everything else. Yeah. So you can't do this. Yeah. Another way, and this is what we opted for, is to make a simulation study and uh, go for a bottom-up process. Build a recurrent neuronal network as similar as we know exists in the cerebral cortex in particular layers, and then see whether adding this oscillatory property buys you something in terms of function. So we configured the nodes of our network, which are usually configured as summation units or integrated fire units. Um, we configured them as damped harmonic oscillators. So if you tap on it, it engages in a damped oscillation. Uh, where you can pre-select the frequency, uh, the damping factor, and the amplitude, so the gain. And it turned out that this was a game changer. As soon as we configured the nodes in our networks, simple recurrent networks as everybody else has them, um, these networks immediately outperformed by orders of magnitude. Most of the, I would say, even all of the commonly available recurrent networks on the market, in terms of learning speeds, noise tolerance, sparsity of elements, and uh, what else was there? Yeah, these are the main, the main variables that were so outstandingly, uh, surprisingly good. Um, the reason is that once you start to enter this field of dynamics, if you couple oscillators, you get immediately a whole. Um, panoply, a whole realm of new phenomena that you don't have otherwise, namely coupled oscillators, they tend to synchronize, but you can also put them out of synchrony. So synchrony is something you, you get uh, once you have oscillators. Once you have oscillators, you get phenomena like resonance, which you don't get otherwise. Yeah. You get entrainment, you get phase shifts, you get frequency shifts. So your coding space is expanded dramatically uh, because you now are in the temporal domain where frequency, amplitude, phase, um, phase shifts, um, interference between wave patterns all of a sudden become apparent. And analyzing these networks now tells us that actually all these phenomena are used for computations. And you can compute now in a very, very high dimensional state space that is both defined in space and in time. And this gives you a huge dimensionality in which you can store nearly infinite uh -huh. amount of information. Also what you get for free, if you have coupled oscillators, these systems have fading memory. Um, because they reverberate okay. and waves expand. So you can superimpose information that is available at different places in the network um, because the waves propagate and then they interfere. And at the place of interference, you can decode both types of information. So you can superimpose information that is temporarily disjunct. So you, you get a lot of very interesting properties. And so, so, so then that, that's the way that the brain can uh, can essentially generate sequences of, of of experiences. Whether there's, you know, like you and I right now, I'm in my brain, right, generating like sequences of things I'm going to say. Actually, before I say them. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. These such networks are e extremely efficient in processing temporal sequences and producing them. So decoding them and producing them. Um, because they live in the temporal domain. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, they charm, and um, because of this extremely high dimensionality and the ability to uh, use interference. Um, resonance and all these phenomena that I was talking about, uh, you can, in parallel, relate a huge amount of variables, namely the activity of every single node with the others. 
And this allows you, or allows for very uh, parallel computation to, to relate a lot of variables with each other at the same time. It's like what happens in a quantum computer, it does the same thing. Um, mathematically, things are similar. Quantum computers use the spin as the continuous variable, and uh, the network that we produce uses the phase of the, of the oscillations as continuous variable. So mathematically, is 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 related. So now, this is, so now think, that you, you know with the, your, these most recent findings you're describing, now it's on on the engineers to make make a, a machine that. Right, because what you're saying is yeah. the, the computers out there, they they don't really mimic human brains. It's so, extremely difficult to mimic such processes. We, we did our simulations on, on digital computers because there's nothing else available. Well, yeah. And it turns out that we have to occupy a, a supercomputer a whole night with a, a large number of GPUs working in parallel in order to simulate a few seconds of these network dynamics. So one has to go for analog technology. And uh, we started to do this. Uh, if you look in the market, it's quite empty. There's nothing has been yeah. developed in the analog domain since mm. the digital revolution. Yeah. Because digital technology turned out to be so much more efficient. And um, so you have great difficulties to find the, <laughs> the elements in yeah. analog technology. Um, but uh, there are still old analog computers around, and uh, we managed to get hold of some of them. So you you can actually wire it up, and we are just trying to see now whether implementing this in hardware buys us something. So the the analog computers were they the, obviously they're not based on zeros and ones and silicon chips. So uh, how... use very yeah that's what so powerful and um i predict that there will be a a return to analog technology in, in a very many domains because it is extremely energy efficient it is extremely fast um it can be um miniaturized no effort has been made so far to do it uh, because everything is done digital but i know of uh, big companies um, getting very interested in analog technology again, in analog computing, let's put it that way. Yeah, it sounds like something some companies should be interested in because if it, you know, if they can make good progress, it's going to be a, a huge, a huge advance. Yeah, it's, it's a very holistic way of computing. And um, so if, if we are right, um, if the brain does it that way and we think that it is a general principle that evolution has discovered and implemented already in very simple nervous systems because all you need is oscillatory neurons and you have them from the very beginning of evolution as pacemaker neurons uh, people working on, on motor systems they are much more familiar with this uh, pattern generating circuits and you find them <clears throat> In, in all different fila, not only in cerebral cortex. So maybe a general principle is discovered. We have uploaded an early paper last fall in bioarchives um, describing this system, but since then it has matured a lot and uh, we're now trying to get it <laughs> peer reviewed. And we know this gambling game is a difficult one. Now, oh, I'm sure it's going to get in with your background and uh, you know. ins insight on this. Uh, okay, so let's talk about consciousness. You know, if, if we go on the internet and put in consciousness, we get all sorts of like philosophical type conversations and so on. And uh, but a consciousness yes. has to be based on neural circuits in the brain. And question: How does it well, first of all, what is consciousness? If you go to the dictionary, it's like awareness of the awareness of the mind or brain of itself and the world. Um, I, I think it's the worst defined concept ever. It's like time. 
And there is a nice word of Augustine, um, Saint Augustine, uh, was I think 450 um, after the Christ, our, our time. He said, uh, if I recall correctly, it has been retranslated by Locke. Um, if everybody knows what time is, but if you ask me what how to define it, I yeah. wouldn't know. Yeah. And the same holds for consciousness. Um, and what the two have in common is there is no center area or whatever to process consciousness in the brain, nor is there for time. Yeah. So those two things share certain similarities. So I think consciousness is so poorly defined that yes. to make it a target of research is already very difficult. There are operational definitions. Um, yeah. People say portability is important for consciousness. So, But we know that um, the brain can perceive and react uh, without being able to report about what it has perceived and act. So there's a lot of subconscious perception of very high levels, very deep perception, and not being able to be reportable through language. Then uh, what else is there? It's contrasted with sleep and coma. That's fine. Um, there is this um, idea of consciousness being a very holistic, um, or at least the platform on which consciousness can manifest itself must be a very holistic um, frame, because everything that appears in consciousness appears there somehow related. Yeah. And there is this seam seamless flow of contents in consciousness, which is also a characteristic feature of consciousness. Then it's the platform for rational deliberation, which is, of course, related again with uh, reportability, with, with language. But there is also nonverbal reasoning, for sure. Mm -hmm. Animals reason. <laughs> then another feature of consciousness, this um, processing space, whatever it is, um, is limited because um, yeah. access to consciousness is created by attention, by salience. So not everything that happens no. can have access to consciousness. Even some processes of the vegetative system that never reach consciousness. So um, there are these operational definitions of consciousness. Then there are these difficult experiments. And I think they're all fraught with flaws. Uh, on the, on the identification of the neural correlates of consciousness, uh, the NCC, um, because most of the experiments that are done, including those we did ourselves, so I'm I'm in the same boat. Um, they usually use fresh, uh, stimuli close to the threshold that are sometimes perceived and sometimes not. And what you do is you measure brain activity <clears throat> in the two cases, sometimes perceived, sometimes not. And then you subtract them, and ah. you assume that what is left over is the signature of the process that is the basis of consciousness. But this is, of course, <clears throat> not true, um, because whether or not it reaps, re nah, reaches this level of conscious processing um, may depend on some pre-processing stages that produce yeah. signals of or lower saliency, and then once you get it into the higher processing areas, it becomes conscious, but the difference will actually be also these very peripheral processes. And then if something appears in consciousness, it has consequences. Um, it, it will be funneled to the language system. Uh, depending on what response you want, it will be funneled to the motor system. It will divert attention. So you get all these additional processes showing up in this difference um, calculation and making it again very difficult to really distill the true and only <laughs> substrate for consciousness. So I think well, well, we that... haven't been able to identify the neural correlates of consciousness unambiguously so far. This is why we have so many different theories hanging around. There's uh, actually a, a huge, but yeah. there are programs now, some funded by the Templeton Foundation, to to trigger adver adversarial experiments, where groups of scientists um, divide into two camps, 
trying to falsify or confirm the respective theories by making experiments jointly. So there yeah. was a, a large program that recently came to an end, I think was celebrated in New York, um, contrasting the uh, workspace hypothesis that had originally been um, proposed by, by Bars and then taken up by Jean Jeu and uh, Stanislas Dian uh, with the information integration theory of um, Giulio Tononi. Um, and as far as I read in, 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 the, in the papers afterwards, um, it was, uh, yeah, not, the, the, the result was not unambiguous. Uh, there, there were pros and cons for both theories. So yeah. um, the discussion is still on. As, but as far as what, you know, so we we can we can attend to something very in a focused manner, right? So I I'm playing some chess lately, online, and when I'm when I'm engaged in a game of chess, inputs coming from outside the chess you know chessboard or sounds just completely you know even my wife asking me a question I don't hear. <laughs> Right. And and so there's this higher it seems to be there's like this hierarchy of you know what becomes perceptible and what's not. And this has to be based in evolution. And you know, what initially during in our daily lives, you know, most of the things we do aren't life or death now, but uh you know, during evolution and in, in animals living in the wild. You know what they attend to uh, is life or death situations. So anyway, um, what's your perspective on the evolution of consciousness, and in terms of selection for individuals with these capabilities? In the case of humans and probably other animals, birds, for example, but particularly mm -hmm. like parrots and corvids, and, right. and probably higher mammals. You know they're they're not only interacting with their environment, but they're they're planning, they're thinking about interactions with, presumably they must be thinking about, you know, other animals in their social group. So can you talk a little bit about that aspect of um, brain evolution right. in, in relation to consciousness? I mean, some, some of the consciousness researchers, they claim that uh, consciousness is epiphenomenal. We don't really need it. Um, and it's, it's just so happened that we as human beings, uh, being mm -hmm. verbal and able to, to mirror each other, we develop this concept, but this is just an attribution and you don't actually need it. You could uh, act like a, a zombie as well. Now, I don't share this uh, because I think you need a platform in the brain where you can integrate um, virtually all the sensory modalities. So you can uh, compare stimuli from outside with what is stored in your brain, because you can also recall and put into consciousness some memories. Um, you have this platform of working memory, and this is probably the, uh, the capacity limiting factor in consciousness that you can only keep a certain amount of items in parallel in working memory. And since it is one of the virtues of conscious <laughs> deliberation uh, to rationally, uh, logically combine um, variables, it's usually done in a serial way. If A is bigger than B and B and C and these sorts of reasonings, uh, rational computations, um, you need a platform um, where you can take information from the outside world if you need it and from your memory and from what is just present in your working memory um, and subject it to these um, rational computations that certainly animals also do. I just said in the beginning, animals can reason, no doubt. Yeah. <clears throat> and they also have maybe a certain amount of meta-awareness. This is probably dependent on, on 
a certain complexity of brains because you need to be able to process brain internal results again in order to uh, run a protocol of what's going on in your brain. Yeah. So it's a sort of meta-awareness, which you need, for example, to um, develop the concept of identity. Um, we will talk about the hard problem later, but this is this is still <laughs> not the hard problem. It's, it's uh, consciousness that is also present in animals. Uh, so we don't talk about spirituality and, and, and the soul and free will and things like that. Um, so I think having this platform uh, is very valuable for survival because you can um, compute predictions for the future. Yeah. You can take many, many different variables and you can select them, recombine them, and then make up your plans for the future. Um, and I would think that this is, is an operation that requires what, what we address as humans, we address as consciousness or this conscious deliberation or certainly animals have it. It's certainly graded. Um, the generality of this platform um, is increasing as brains become more complex because what you observe when in, in, in the phylogeny that um, simple brains have fairly isolated loops from sensory surfaces into yeah. motor output. Yeah. There's not too much, which makes it difficult for these animals if they have learned a certain association in the visual domain to generalize it to the auditory domain or mm. to the tactile domain. Mm. In humans, we can do it very easily, yeah. but we have all these, these bridges between the processing streams, which allows us to discover the say the the similar in the seemingly different, right? Yeah. Um, which is a basic operation for abstraction. Once you can do this, you can abstract, and this in turn is a basic pre prerequisite for symbolic coding, and symbolic coding is the prerequisite for for a rational language. Yeah. So, this is how how it came, but. Um, Right. So, so I think it's a graded phenomenon. And and, um, and so during brain development, then there so for consciousness, there has to be some information already inputted, some prior information to for the brain to draw upon. Well, yeah, all the brains, of course, have a, a lot of a priori information about the world in which they they have to act later uh, already because of their architecture. Um, there's so much information stored in the specific wiring of brains, and part of this is obviously genetically determined. So some of the ways in which brains process information, they are already adapted to the environment in which these brains have evolved. Um, yeah. Leave alone, well, I, I, I trained as a develop. I trained as a developmental neurobiologist, and and so then one question that comes up, you know, how, how does this consciousness arise during brain development? So presumably, you know that it's just that as the circuits form and they start, you get actually you get these oscillations. You can put neurons in a culture dish and you'll get these oscillations, right? So you can have, uh, yeah. so some of the features of these networks, you know, as you said, there's some kind of spontaneous, genetically determined initial activity that then is kind of sculpted or modified by, by inputs coming in. And then also you can, then get generation of new new information that comes internally. So it's kind of interesting to think about what's happening during, for example, development of the cerebral cortex in relation to consciousness. Yeah, I, I, I don't know how... Well, we know how consciousness or different levels of consciousness evolve in, in babies. 
if we talk about human consciousness, yeah, um, there are studies of developmental um, psychologists. Piaget started this field uh, where you can follow how the baby brain, by interacting with its environment, uh, complements the information it already has about the environment because a lot is already built in in the way in which the various sensory centers are, are wired up. But then it learns a lot <clears throat> by using uh, statistical learning strategies, heavy modifications, yeah. and by trial and error, and when yeah. babies learn that and belongs to them. They have to manipulate it and yeah. establish correlations between what the hand does and what they see. And as time goes on, they start to develop uh, a concept of the self, yeah. which is used very much in consciousness tests. The animals where you paint the nose, and yeah. look at the mirror test. Yeah. You have to look in the mirror. If yeah. they see that if they start to scratch, you assume they have recognized that it's them and not something else. Yeah. So this is a gradual process, and I think very important question you asked. This gradual process of being embedded, but now this is more related to the heart problem of consciousness, <laughs> embedded in a world that has uh, found um, names for phenomena that are related to consciousness, like intentionality, consciousness itself, um, free will, um, responsibility, and so forth. Uh, if you are raised in such a world as a baby, yeah, you also learn immature realities as priors, and you use these priors in order to shape your perception of <clears throat> processes that occur in this uh, non-material domain, in the social domain. And so, um, but maybe we get there later. Uh, no, I think that's a good point to, to, to start talking about that. Um, yeah, so, so go ahead with uh, these kind of uh, immaterial. Um, okay, well, let's close the first chapter and say it's still a huge challenge to identify the neuronal correlates of consciousness. Um, which is not yet addressing the hard problem of consciousness, namely the question of how material processes can give rise to these immaterial realities, spirituality, and so forth, which are at the basis of dualistic ontological theories, because um, many of us, I think not so much the neurobiologists, <clears throat> tend to be convinced that there is some immaterial part of us, some spiritual dimension that we part we participate in, that is part of us, but that is somehow independent of the brain. Um, and that would be the place where decisions are made, intentions are formulated, um, and all these mental phenomena would occur. Um, and that this, whatever shape it takes and wherever it is, uh, this immaterial entity somehow mysteriously interacts with the material pro processes within the brain so that they, the neurons, realize what this immaterial entity intends to do, perceives, decides. Um, this is a dualistic stance that cannot be falsified. Um, but it is defendable, and uh, many people do defend it, and you sort of need it in, in order to be coherent with certain religions and belief systems. But for neurobiologists, it's of course, difficult um, to accept, because we see evolution as a continuous process. Um, there's no disruption uh, <clears throat> in the immersions of, of humans from, uh, let me say, there's no disruption, disruptive event in, in, the, in the biological evolution that brought us forth as humans. Um, but there is, of course, something that happened at a certain stage in biological evolution. This is when 
cognitive agents appeared on the on the scene that were the first first tunes uh, able to speak use a symbolic communication system and um, name phenomena that they were able to observe as a community on which they could agree that there is something that does exist which you can't touch but which you can feel which you can perceive um, and then give a name to it and create an immaterial reality so let me give you an example uh, neanderthals sit in front of the cage and uh, cave and eat together and people start to realize that there is a guy who always takes food first, who never shares, and who is greedy. While there are others who are very generous, always share, and are the opposite of uh, greedy. They are, uh, yeah, um, generous. Yeah. So these are things that you can perceive, but you can't touch. They, they don't exist in the material world. But since you can perceive them, and if you can collectively perceive them and agree upon them as being what there's, there's consensus that there is something, you find a name for it. And in this moment, you have a reality. And this is a social reality, as John Zell would call it. It's immaterial, but it's, it's real in the sense that it is very efficient. Because if you attribute greediness to somebody, um, that means something. And these immaterial realities, like also the contents of belief systems, they're extremely powerful. They made us erect cathedrals because um, yeah. there was nothing material that told us to do. Uh, so humans, by uh, social interactions and symbolic exchange of ideas, you need language, otherwise it doesn't work. This is why animals haven't produced cultures, they have not built cathedrals. You create a new layer of reality on top of the material reality, which is concrete, influential, it has consequences, and you can agree upon, and you have names for it. And now the question remains, why do we attribute this immaterial dimension also to us. First of all, we created it, but then as, as I just alluded to, if you are raised in such an environment where these realities are named and are used uh, <clears throat> also for education, um, the concept of responsibility is impregnated very early into, into childhood, and the concept of guilt and the concept of revenge and all these things. Uh, they are attributed to the growing child. And there's also self-attribution because uh, you sort of want to explain why um, you do this and not that. And so you get the impression there is something in inside that decides and judges, but you can't grasp it because the processes in your brain are transparent. You, you have no recollection of what's going on in your brain. Um, it's also the reason why you, you think about free will as being a reality, because you, you don't see the processes, you don't feel them, that prepare the decisions at the neural level. So you get attributed this spiritual dimension by your... Um, by those who raise you yeah. and you self-attribute it in order to explain a lot of phenomena that otherwise you couldn't explain yeah. and of course you run into huge complications if you do this and this is <laughs> we created the complication of consciousness and the hard problem ourselves uh, because you get the problem of mental causation um, if there is this spiritual dimension that is independent of the brain but interacts with the brain somehow in order to make the brain do what the spiritual thing um, entity uh, has decided to do, um, then you run from one difficulty to the next. And there is the explanatory gap um, that a neurobiologist cannot close. So I think neuroscience by itself, if you just analyze brains, um, you won't be able to solve that hard problem at all. 
But you have to go back into evolutionary anthropology, take seriously the humanities, who actually, they deal with this immaterial world, the world of concepts, the world of attributions. Um, so right. but, I think there was a continuum. Clearly there was, yeah. uh, so, Wolf, clearly there is a adaptive value in so, some of these immaterial realities are, I would say, imaginary things, right? In, for example, group cohesion, uh, yeah. you know, having people, you know, grouped together. And of course, we as a species uh, evolved that's thought in small groups, maybe 50, the most 100 people. Uh, and then we had different territories, right? And we're in a world where there's thunderstorms and lightning and tornadoes and floods and hurricanes and forest fires. And, you know, we, so it's kind of a, a scary world. And if we don't know what's causing something, then we attribute some, yeah. some higher, you know, ill-defined or undefined thing to that and um yeah the old ancient cultures they 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 had goddesses for all these phenomena there was Thor throwing the lightnings and there was yeah. another one creating thunder and yeah, yeah uh, we are more or less at the same stage but we know a little bit more so we can explain some phenomena for yeah. others we still have to postulate uh these transcendental forces so we course. can we, we can live in both reality and non-reality and that seems to be a good it seems to be a good mixture for humans or it has been yeah. it it can be yes, bad it can it, be bad too but you know, yes yeah. the flip side also because um, yeah. without these abilities you wouldn't have ideologies yes you you couldn't create virtual worlds and then identify with them in the way we do it and then break loose a war simply because of these ideas yes and that's of course what we see now in the moment in a dramatic way yeah uh, happen everywhere yeah that's true that's true so yeah but i think i think there's some real value in people learning about this neuroscience the if possible the general public or at least some of these concepts so that they can rationalize uh, their own what's going on in their own kind of perception. Well, for us, it's a huge challenge because on the one hand, we tell the people uh, and convince ourselves as neurobiologists, yes, all cognitive functions that we are uh, identifying in humans and animals, they are based on your own interaction. And there's so much proof of evidence that yeah. one can't cannot deny this. Yeah. <clears throat> At the same time, um, our subjective feeling is that we are part of a sp spiritual dimension. That there is an immaterial world that is very important in which we are embedded. Uh, that um, is probably as important for the. Um, motivation and control of our actions is, is the material world, yeah. at least for us humans. Um, and uh, so we have to explain how come that um, both views can be correct, uh, which is the hard problem. Um, within the neurobiological description systems, explanation of cognitive functions it's not too difficult. This is classical psychophysics that should work. Um, and maybe partly it, it works. But how then come to this spiritual dimension? And I think this transcends the explanatory power of neuroscience proper. Yeah. And in order to get there, you need to reconsider or need to consider cultural evolution, cultural phenomena. Um, you need the humanities and their language in order to um 
attempt to get a continuous development from biological evolution into cultural evolution, and right. then to the exploration of this or the generation of this immaterial world, the immaterial reality in which we are embedded, yeah. and um, take into consideration also how this reality interacts with the processes in the brain, because this is certainly co-evolution. Yeah. Uh, once you have this dimension, you have to adapt to this dimension. Yeah. Uh, we created this dimension, we have adapted to it, we see the advantages, but also the pitfalls. Yeah. Um, yeah. Animals don't do not do such cruel things as we do uh, in the name of religion, belief systems, ideologies, convictions, yeah. Yeah. and attributions. Yeah. So this yeah. is the Janus face. Yeah. Yeah, it's very, in this country, it's <clears throat> a big issue, but it's, uh, well, I don't want to talk about the problems in in our country, but which are quite 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 extensive at this particular time. Yeah, we have them all over the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They are basic structures of the same. Uh, <clears throat> no. But I think that you know we have a war in Europe. Science illiteracy, science illiteracy is a big problem in the United States. You know, by the general public, they're just simple, basic, basic things. You know, like what's the difference between pro probability and possibility? And um, you know, it, it's you know, uh, just basic fundamental things that that have a big. They're very important. We, we, are, yeah. we are betraying the big project of humanity of humanism. It was started in Europe in the Renaissance times um, during the yeah. time that we address this enlightened enlightenment or yeah. I don't know how you call it Aufklärung in German enlightenment yeah I think um, where, where the project was exactly this um, try to find out how things are really happening make experiments try to falsify ideas, be critical, question things, don't take for granted what you perceive because your perception is a constructivistic process based on priors. Yeah. Um, so try to find rational solution to problems, discuss them, and then jo jointly go for it. Um, but we are betraying this, this project to yeah. a fantastic uh, a, a dramatic amount of now. Um, and this is very worrying because if we, if we fall back into medieval um, practices of taking belief systems um, as um, the guidance for our behavior, um, and if those beliefs don't match reality, uh, then we are in big trouble. I remember back and, in the uh, humans are back in the 1980s um, when there was already accumulating a lot of evidence that uh, CO2 coming coming from fossil fuels was uh, starting to warm the the planet. And Carl Sagan, the famous Carl Sagan, uh, he he actually testified before the Senate. The U.S. Senate, and and essentially he he had a way of explaining things to the general public that were understandable, and so he explained this that you know if we don't stop this, there's going to be big problems down the road, and and here we are. And but one one line I remember that he said was that this combustible mixture of ignorance and power is going to blow up in our face. And what he meant was that the people who run the government, the politicians, they have no, they're ignorant when it comes to, to science completely. There's, I don't know if there's any, I can't think of a single, I can think of a few MDs that 
uh, are people that went to medical school that are in Congress, but there's pretty much no scientists. So you have you have people making decisions that are going to have huge can have huge impact on society, and they don't have any rational. They don't have a rational basis for making those policies. That's a big. Uh, but there is also a big reason why you don't have scientists at the rudder of power, because um, in democracies you get into power if you are able to get the majority behind you. Yeah. And if you behave like a scientist um, and you reason like a scientist, giving one argument immediately followed by the counter argument because you have a methodological doubt. Um, yeah. Science works by not believing. Science works by criticizing. Science works by questioning truth. Right. If you, if you display this behavior, um, nobody will elect you and trust you because, and we saw this during the COVID pandemic. Yeah. Um, yeah. Scientists, of course, nobody knew exactly what to do, but at least science had some evidence and something to say. But um, the public at large realized that the scientists had different opinions, different appreciations of the situation, and um, started to not believe scientists anymore because of that. Yeah. Not understanding the constitutive principle of of science to to yeah. to doubt, to question, yeah. to argue, you have these sense, yeah. um, and um, so this is why science and politics are so orthogonal. Yeah, um, I wish they were not, because uh, I think, as you say, uh, the, the the rational way is the only way to overcome these these hor horrific problems that we have in the moment. Yeah, yeah. Right, if, so, if, so maybe, you know, if people you, will... Yeah, it's, it's interesting, you, you go on. You, uh, let's take a few more minutes. Yeah, if they knew how much perception depends on priors, right. and that what you perceive you for granted, but yeah. you have no recollection of the priors that shaped your perception, uh, then they would uh, develop a completely different concept of tolerance. Because then you have to understand that if you are raised in one particular culture, you have a particular set of priors in your head, and then you see a, a social interaction, and your perception is completely different from the one that somebody socialized in a different culture will have. So you cannot question the perception that somebody has. It's yeah. always perceived as true truth, not further reducible. So all the argument, you are right and you are wrong, is, you can't do this in the intercultural discourse. Yeah. So yeah. the other strategies need to be developed. But you need to know those basics in order to behave a bit more rational. Yeah, yeah. I agree. OK, and then uh, obviously a, a big issue, problem, kind of a Another problem is is money. You know who who's where's who's making the money? Where's the money going? And you know because we have this big problem yeah. of, of industry influencing the politicians. Uh, big industries, uh, you know, influencing what decisions the, the politicians are making. So that's a whole nother issue kind of the greed the issue of greed and money yeah, yeah there's a strange thing about um, uh, the the relation between money and uh, happiness <laughs> i think there's a lot of research <laughs> yeah. on this now knowing that it is not the absolute amount that you have it is having a little bit more, more than your neighbor <laughs> and then it doesn't matter how much if, if, if you have ten dollars more than well if your income is modest, then your neighbor is fine. Um, and there is no difference whether it's a $10 difference or whether it's a billion dollar difference <clears throat> because it's like the Weber Fechner. <laughs> it's, it, it's a psychophysical law. Yeah. <laughs> no, that's, that, that's true. Well, but that's kind of what being greedy is, right? Do you, 
you want started out in evolution you wanted to get most of the food so that you could survive and now it has nothing to do with whether you can survive or not it has something to do with this uh, i guess immaterial uh, reality of, of you you just have yeah, to, it's, it's competition we are yeah. competitive animals yeah and to win is always um, rewarded yeah. yeah okay well okay well well i appreciate you taking the time for this uh you made fantastic contributions to understanding how the brain works there's a as we've seen in this, in our conversations, still a lot to learn. And I'm looking forward to seeing the analog computers coming out. Yeah, me too. Based on your, your modeling, and I look forward to that paper coming out in whatever, science, nature, or whatever you sent it. <laughs> you, you can find it in bioarchives already. The, the, the okay, I'll, 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 look, I'll look it up. I'll look it up. Okay, well, have a good have a good rest of the summer. You too. Thank you very much. It was nice talking to you. Okay. Bye. bye.